and uh, today is a very significant day and a happy women's day to all the participants and my regards to senior and uh, best wishes to junior and uh, this is a wonderful initiative uh, uh, by the uh, crd 10 and uh, now crd 10 uh, we have a national chair and uh, we have advisor and uh, this is a series i like the title of the series gender dialogue series uh, thank you very much uh, i like this uh, title very much and also the specific uh, title of uh, uh, this program breaking the bias uh, and uh, thank you professor padi uh, professor salna mehta and all other uh, you know uh, empowered women who are attending this uh, webinar and also i best of luck to the speaker uh, the panelist of today's uh, webinar breaking the bias i don't want to stand between you on behalf of uh, uif uh, and behalf of uh, all the partner organization i would like to you know extend uh, uh, greetings best wishes and uh, i hand over the platform virtual platform to dr rasmi pramanik uh, to coordinate over to dr rasmi pramanik a very good evening to one and all. At the outset, I would like to wish everyone a happy International Women's Day. Honorable President UIAF, Professor Behra, Secretary UIAF, Professor Grigory, Professor Itishri Pari, all the six esteemed panelists who would be sharing their views in this webinar. My deep regards to all the senior anthropologists and the budding academicians who are virtually connected to this platform. It is my utmost pleasure to be a part of this gender dialogue series. This is the first event of the series. On this special occasion of the International Women's Day, the core team group of UIAF Anthropology of Women, as stated by Professor Behera, has taken the initiative to observe this important day. The theme is breaking the bias. What is this biasness all about? It is the gender biasness seen in our society. In a simple sense, it is a behavior that shows favoritism towards one gender over another. We live in a gender asymmetric society where women are discriminated and excluded. Daughters of our country are denied of their rightful place in this patriarchal society and trenched in the belief that women are a liability to the society and to their families as well. In many cases, they are deprived of their basic rights. They face injustice, inequality, and are further considered to be the vulnerable section of the society. This is not a natural process. They are socially constructed in this way. The cultural construction of womanhood is such that she is always expected to be at the receiving end. They are subjected to subordination and are marginalized. It is the need of the hour to break this biasness in our communities, at our workplaces, and within our families as well. This evening, will definitely be a brainstorming session where we will listen to six panelists of which three are young academicians and three are senior scholars. Before giving them the floor, I would just like to mention very kindly that they should stick to the time limit. Young scholars, please confine your presentation to 10 minutes and it's my humble request to the senior scholars that they confine their sharings within 15 minutes. Prior to that, I may request Dr. Pari to give an introductory address and open the session. Just to briefly introduce Dr. Itishri Pari. She is currently a professor and head department of anthropology in BJB Autonomous College, Bhubaneswar, Orissa. She has done her doctoral and postdoctoral research on women and gender studies. 
She has to have credit more than 30 research publications and has authored five books. Her area of research interest is in tribal studies, children and childhood, and development studies. So I request Dr. Pari to come to the platform. Dr. Pari. Once again, a very happy Women's Day to all of you. Namaskar and good evening, everyone. Um, esteemed uh, President of uh, United Indian Anthropology Forum, Professor Deepak Kumar Behra. Um, esteemed uh, Secretary UIF, Professor Gigri. Um, all senior teachers present here, all academicians, young anthropologists, and everyone directly, indirectly associated with UIF. I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to this forum for once again giving me an opportunity to be a part of this gender series. My special thanks to Professor Shalina Mehta, who has been our guiding and binding force of this forum, of, of our uh, uh, team, and uh, without which uh, it could not have happened the way it is happening. The, uh, starting from flyer to selection of uh, speakers and the moderator and everything we have done under her strict guidance. So thank you so much, ma'am. And uh, let me speak. Uh, let me start this uh, webinar with uh, as Rashmi has uh, requested. I will definitely stick to fifteen minutes and uh, let me start. Tamoshoma Jyotirgmaya. From darkness to light, the journey of women, from four walls of the house to a multitasking career woman, has really been remarkable and enticing. Even today, a woman struggles to break the bias and to earn a name of her own. We are in a society where bias, discrimination, Violence abuse against women are as old as civilization, and the efforts to combat those issues are also very unsaid. I'm not going to discuss cases like Nirbhaya, who was brutally killed after sexual violence and gang rape. Most horrifying, and is considered as one of the most heinous crime the earth that has happened on earth. But I am definitely going to throw a little light on how a woman faces bias, discrimination, and the threat of violence at each stage of her life throughout the life cycle, from conception till the completion of her life. Here it goes. If the sex of the baby in the mother's womb comes out to be female, then all efforts are being made to about the fetus leading to female feticide. If not, the baby girl is born, then both parents and family members desperately try to kill the baby immediately, to get rid of the baby immediately by killing her, which leads to causing female infanticide. Here again, the girl serves. Here again, the girl survives, but no one is there to welcome her arrival. During growing up years, the both boy and girl are in the same environment. There is clear-cut discrimination on food, clothing, education, medical, health care. Every time the girl is made to realize that she is a girl and is inferior to boy, so should mind more in household course. Very soon, parents of the girls start looking for a suitable boy for their daughter for marriage. Even much before the uh, girl attends to marriageable age. Before that, adolescent reaches and the girl is put under a lot of restrictions once the girl attends to physical maturity. Don't go here, don't come there. Ask your father, escort your brother, fear is sexual harassment. Even much before the girl completely understands what is bad touch, what is good touch, 
she starts losing all her freedom, especially freedom of movement, and is hardly allowed to step out. Then at a very early age, the parents look, up, look for a suitable boy for their daughter. And unfortunately, the girl is never asked whether she is mentally, physically, or emotionally ready to get married or not. No one feels the need to ask her opinion. Does this parayadhan with a lot of dowry at a very young age leaves her natal family with a man he never knew before, he never seen before, and enters into a completely new home, completely new family with a lot of hopes, aspirations, and apprehensions. Many times, life takes a U-turn here. She starts struggling with many struggles, with many issues, including the issue of dowry, which many times pushes her to bride burning, homicide, or suicide. If not, at the very early age, she becomes mother to children with no interval between pregnancies, jeopardizing her own health and life. Interestingly, if the children born to the women are all daughters, she is totally blamed for that, never her husband. Even here, science seems to fail. And then once the, the next phase of violence, what, what I feel is when a woman loses her husband or the husband of the woman dies, women, the, a widow woman faces maximum misery in his life. Widowhood brings maximum misery to the life of women. She is compelled to lead an astral life. She is forced to wear white clothes. She is forced to take strict vegetarian food and is not allowed to take any festive occasions, to take part in any festive occasions. And most pathetic is when a widow mother is not allowed to take part in her own child's marriage or any ritual, considering her presence as inauspicious. Is not it surprising that uh, a mother could ever be inauspicious or forbidden for her own child? Here, here I, where I feel strongly feel to break the bias. And the other area where a woman faces the violence is to go for repeated pregnancies with uh, uh, continuous abortions to have a male child in her life. If a woman has only produced daughters, then she is directly or indirectly compelled to go for repeated pregnancies followed by repeated abortions till she goes for till she gives birth to a baby boy. It is believed that only a son can bring fortune and glory to the life of a woman and his family. That is why in our society, every woman silently or secretly desires to be the mother of a baby boy. These are only, and widowhood, uh, widow remarriage, when it is far, far remote for a woman, there is no hard and fast rule for a widow who prepares himself to remarry much before his dead wife's death ritual is over. This is again where, you, where we need to break the bias. These are only glimpses of violence, threats of violence, that a woman faces throughout her life. There are many in between, and the woman faces as and when it comes on her way. Now, the question that comes to my mind is, are not we all responsible for what is happening around us? If gender is a social construct, and it starts in the family first, then we all family members are directly responsible for it, or we are acting as silent onlookers to happen it around. Do this because you are a girl. Don't do this because you are not a boy. This is our processes of socialization and enculturation. A woman is denied, not because she is uh, incapable or incompetent, but because she is a woman. It is quite natural that a boy is a chef because he is skilled in cooking 
and a girl could be a very good swimmer or horse rider if she has passion for that. Everything depends on the competence and potential, never on the sex of the individual. In this context, I firmly believe two things inevitable to break the bias and to bring constructive positive change to our society. The first one is education. Education holds the touch for the beginning of an enlightened society. Education helps us to differentiate between right and wrong and to raise our voice against injustice. It is again education that gets us employment, making us economically independent. Napoleon once rightly said, give me an educated mother, I promise you the birth of an educated and civilized nation. What a powerful statement. This is the power of education. And women, when empowered with education, they do wonders. The second thing, which I feel more important is family upbringing. Family roots are an undercurrent to the life we live. Who we are cannot be separated from where we are. A good and tremendous upbringing is highly desirable for the character building of every individual. For example, if a child witnesses his father abusing his mother every day and his mother is tolerating that, then he is made to understand that he is a, the child is made to understand that he is a man and has the right to do that. And she is a woman. It is a duty to tolerate what her husband is doing. Thus, when the boy, when the child grows up, there is every possibility that he may develop with the same attitude which, which may continue for generations. And uh, I must tell you, each man, each man may not be a perpetrator, but each woman is a victim. So in this context, I feel that protecting a girl child is not the call of the hour. What is more important is making the girl child her own protector, making her realize her potential, her capability, her rights, so that she can be her own protector. There is no point in equating a boy with a girl because each one is an unique and special creation of God. Both are complementary and supplementary to each other. Let she be she and he be he. We parents, teachers, family members as responsible citizens of our motherland must endeavor together and shoulder this huge responsibility in breaking the bias and uh, making a gender-free society in reality. Now coming to working women who constitute an important section of our society. They have greater responsibility towards the society. They are like frontline workers, frontline warriors in breaking the bias in our society. A working mother produces a boy who encourages his uh, wife to work because his mother was working. The working mother produces a girl who loves to work because her mother was working. What could be a better way to break the bias for this for a new beginning? Now in the context of COVID-19 situation, it, needless to say, that the post-COVID-19 world will never be the same as it was before. And the world witnessed the role and responsibility of women in handling this difficult situation. They ta women taught us how to handle this difficult situation, how to bounce back in this toughest situation. She worked from home. She managed her husbands without work and alcohol. She managed children without school and sports. And she managed home without help. And, and which all have made, their, made her life more challenging. And she proved that women, nari tabhi bhariti, abhi bhari hai. Man purush, tabhi abhari tha, abhi abhari hai. Now before I conclude, 
I must mention both he and she are created with same dignity, having same access to salvation, protection, and uh, blessings. Just like man, a woman needs to be happy and contented for the healthy growth of society. But one thing we must not forget that celebration of International Women's Day or Women's Day is never to let down man. I repeat, celebration of Women's Day is never to let down man, but to give women a better and a more beautiful life she deserves. I quote two lines from one of the most popular classic Hindi movie, Nayador of Dilip Kumar. There is a beautiful uh, song with good, very good lyrics. Sati Hat Badhana, Ek Akela Thak Jayega, Milkar Boj Uthana. I believe in togetherness. Togetherness is our strength. Together we stand, together we work, together we can win to break the bias. Because wherever there is women, there is magic. And uh, I wish there will be no female leader tomorrow. There will be only leaders. Thank you all. Once again, a very happy Women's Day to all of you. Thank you so much. Dr. Pari, for your kind words and very precisely giving the introductory speech. Dr. Pari lucidly explained the journey of a woman from the four walls to the multitasking responsibilities. She highlighted how the violence, discrimination, injustice for a girl child rise right from the cradle to the grave. And she further pointed that it is how a girl is socialized and encultured in a family. Dr. Pari rightly pointed on the cultural prescription and proscription of a girl child. Thank you so much, Dr. Pari. Now, the first speaker or the panelist of this session is Dr. Sreyashi Bhattacharya. I welcome her. To just briefly introduce Dr. Bhattacharya, she is currently working as a resource person for capacity building and training of Panchayati Raj institutions at the Society for Training and Research in Panchayats and Rural Development at Kolkata. Her doctoral research was on growing up in a dual career family, a study of adolescent children in Sambalpur city of Western Orissa. Her area of research interest is on in anthropology of children in childhood, gender issues, and tribal studies. So, Dr. Bhattacharya, this is your phone. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Vishnu, for this wonderful welcome address. I'm honored. Um, all the honorable associates at this virtual platform and all the esteemed participants, a very good evening to all of you. At the outset, I would like to convey my heartfelt thanks and gratitude to United Indian Anthropological Forum for giving me this opportunity to deliberate my standpoint concerning the fascinating theme breaking the bias on this International Women's Day 2022, which is apparently an incipient topic of dialogue. My epilogue today will be focusing on the arena, COVID-19 lockdown and its interest on gender bias in families and where we really successful in breaking those biases during that unprecedented time. My lookout uh, today will be majorly focused or uh, grounded on my research findings from an empirical study I made uh, on the work-life balance of Bengali women when work meets home during COVID-19 lockdown. I would definitely try to comprise my uh, uh, deliberation as much as possible because there is a constraint of time. Each year on 8th March, organizations and individuals around the globe come together to honor the struggle of women for social, economic, and political equality and to celebrate their achievements and contribution to society. It is not just about acknowledging and applauding the immeasurable contribution of women but an occasion to rally support for their rights, 
and to collectively reflect on the challenges to and opportunities for achieving gender equality. The 2022 uh, Indian uh, International Women's Day campaign theme, Hashtag Break the Bias, and the UN Women theme, Gender Equality Today for a Sustainable Tomorrow, is looking forward to recognize the contribution of women and girls who are leading the charge on response to build a more sustainable future for all. Tremendous advancements have been made in science and technology. Our economies are getting stronger. Our living standards are improving. However, in our country, India, and the world at large, we have made limited progress in the arena of gender equality. We are lagging behind when it comes to uh, breaking the biases based on conventional notions of masculinity and femininity. A global gender gap report 2021 uh, produced by the World Economic Forum clearly shows that the gender gap is wide, particularly in political empowerment and economic participation. In fact, many studies report that gender and social inequalities have been aggravated with climate change and the ongoing pandemic. Recent research by the Institution of Health Metrics and Evaluation at the Washington University revealed that women have experienced greater negative social and economic impact than men. COVID-19 undeniably brought into an unprecedented time in our life, especially during the first lockdown, when many organizations forced businesses to relook their operations without any disruption and adopted to work from home policy to contain the infection. But then again, the home scenario was quite different as allies their male counterparts, the women professionals had to get involved into work from home inside their household. At one hand, this certainly allowed the quality of family time, the quality of we time, but on the flip side, brewed many challenges for these women professionals due to the non-appearance of day-to-day -day domestic helpers or mates even though they were trying hard to overcome the difficult situations with their commitments, their competencies, and preservance. During that unsolicited phase, I made a humble and probing attempt to find out the answer of two unpretentious research questions. That work from home is actually no or less work for women professionals? Is it a bias thinking? Did gender stereotype roles carry the day in dual career families during the COVID-19 lockdown? The research design I employed for finding the answers of my research questions was purely qualitative. The study had been conducted in Kolkata, and I had to hang on different virtual platforms like WhatsApp call, Google Meet, Zoom, while interacting with my 30 research participants who belong to Bengali community, between the age group of 30 to 40, working at different IT sectors and having more than five years of working experience. Semi-structured, open-ended interviews were conducted to perceive their life experiences from their own voices. These women, either they belong to nuclear families or living with their in-laws, that means they belong to extended families. I uh, categorized them into two clusters. First, marriage with child, and the second cluster is married without a child. So, uh, in consistent with my research findings, it would not be erroneous to remark that still in a patriarchal country like India, even in a metropolitan city like Kolkata, the dual career families are in a perplexed status quo. Be it in a nuclear family or extended family, gender roles are still not allocated here without any gender bias or stereotypes. And regrettably, women still have to experience conflicting responsibilities and commitments while balancing between work and family. Now, pertaining to my first research question, that during COVID-19 lockdown, work from who was actually more work or less work for women? My research findings significantly address upon the very fact that maximum household force and child we are in task to get gender bias and attributed to women even in that unprecedented time, although some gender roles were shared. Among the participants, married women with a single child reported that work from home is difficult for them. 
his responsibilities uh, towards their child was unceasingly disrupting their working time even after they try to do their best their mental state has been frustrated tired and of anxious which ultimately disrupt the mental and emotional well-being of the family at large Captivating with the participants who are having a child and belong to extended families, they showed a kind of positive responses uh, to this work from home setting, as they were getting a support in household responsibilities from other family members, and even in childcare when domestic helpers were not present. Despite some optimistic responses, the study enlightens the very fact that working women unquestionably face a lot of challenges. while balancing their work and personal life even in a work from home setting uh, and only if there was some variation of their responses it was uh, either related with their the variables like their motherhood or the structure of their family the type of family they belong to now referring to the next research questions that if gender stereotype role prevails in dual career families during that quarantine situation the study finds out that voice from the voices of my research participants that yes obviously some roles were definitely shifted without any bias during that lockdown their quarantine experiences designate that even though the traditional gender roles were undeniably less observable in those days than before uh, some of my uh, participants from extended families stated that uh, they were furious about gender inequality sometimes and had arguments with their spouses traditional gender roles were clearly observed uh in the spouse's attitude when the participant belonged to an extended familial setup while men utilized more time in recreation women had to prioritize their household responsibilities which was really difficult without any support sometimes so a concluding remark can be certainly be drawn that work from home was undeniably unquestionably without any doubt was more work for a woman working women especially uh, with children during this unprecedented time of covid-19 lockdown as the boundary between home and work was blurred and along with prolonged working hours which the workplace actually demanded during that time the non supporting role of the spouses especially in extended families made it more forbidding even though uh In an, uh, even though the samples belong to same linguistic community, culture, familiar culture, uh, familiar working sectors, almost with a uniform degree of work pressure, the issues related to gender disparities surface within these small samples. In a nutshell, COVID-19 had failed to listen and somehow deepen the existing gender inequalities in families. and proved in a way that still we are very far ahead in breaking the gender bias at familial front at familial role even in an extreme situation so since every action counts in combating gender inequalities together we have to pave the way towards breaking these biases based on discriminatory gender norms and practices even in family so on this international women's day 2022 let us pledge to break these biases that underpin inequalities and exclusions in varied arena including family and advance towards a gender and socially equal and inclusive world thank you everyone a happy international women's day thank you very much dr shreya shin for spelling out some vital issues how it was difficult for the working women to strike a balance between their job responsibilities at their workplace and their job responsibilities at their home as well the gender stereotype roles were sometimes demotivating for them sometimes it also seemed that work from home would be easier but really what your experience speaks that work from home was not easy during this covid-19 situation and gender disparity in the family and this biasness needs to be broke down so thank you very much shreyashi now the second speaker of the session is dr mitashri shivastava a brief introduction about her she is an assistant professor at the department of anthropology university of delhi 
the present research focuses on narrative and discourse analysis to understand the construction of buddhist identities in the south asian globalizing context she is interested in finding out the significance of trans nationalization in shaping up experiences and interpretations of what constitutes authentic buddhist identity in 21st century global world she is also interested in the collection description and analysis of narrative history and testimonials of becoming buddhists unveiling the relationship between religious experience and identity formation in contemporary times she holds the prestigious nalanda buddhist philosophy diploma award from the tibet house delhi over to dr mitashri shrivastava please the floor is yours uh, i'll be presenting a structured presentation which i have prepared on the motivation of professor shalina mehta when she requested me to volunteer for the program because i like writing i'm a story seeker dealing with narratives and discourses so i thought it's time to pick up the pen and uh, here i go first of all a very warm good evening to the audiences i extend my heartfelt greetings to you on this significant occasion of the international women's day 8th of march 2022 it's indeed a privilege and honor for me to participate in this gender dialogue series of the UIAF the first of its kind in the country today i take this dais in the capacity of a woman a woman academician and a woman anthropologist attempting to decode what it means to break the bias seeking inspiration from my own academic journey and the journey of the buddhist women i encounter in the field let me begin with a small anecdote there is a classic romantic comedy movie which is titled as the holiday it's about two stranger women from two different parts of the world the uk and the us who are trying to make a holiday what they decide is that they will swap their homes they will swap their homes and they will swap their lives and they will be in two different all together different countries what happens as a consequence is that they land up in a mess sharing each other's life now what i want to indicate by this small story is that no matter how hard we women try to just escape from the monotony and drudgery of our everyday lives perhaps the ideal place to discover a freedom is right here where we are now but this is possible only when we learn how to break the bias now how do we do that perhaps breaking the bias begins with ourselves it is about deconstructing our own life stories not in order to identify the collapsing fragments of it but to acknowledge the entire semiotics that goes behind building a woman's life on an everyday basis women's desires emotions ambitions priorities claims stakes and rights breaking the bias is not about avoiding the dangerous territories which the patriarchal authorities and the patriarchal channels have laid in front of us it is about learning the apt skills of carefully navigating through them breaking the bias is about reflecting how can stereotypes be smashed gender discrimination be at bay and gender parity be promoted by being vigilant about the atrocities happening to women around us it's about ignoring if not hitting back to all the sexist remarks and identifying the counter narratives of women empowerment breaking the bias is moving beyond any standard definition of feminism and focusing on all the feminities which are there present in local and cultural contexts breaking the bias is not about asking if women have a choice or agency it's about the intelligent strategizing of how our choices can lead us to be active campaigners of change in the society breaking the bias is deciding for a gender neutral and a gender sensitive society dismantling all the false assumptions that go regarding gender performativity or about queer conscience 
Breaking the Bias, is about celebrating the social, cultural, political, and religious achievements of women by building women networks, solidarity groups, communication channels, opening up perspectives and debates on the safety, dignity, value, and freedom of women. Now, coming to some reflections from my professional life. As a banker turned academician, I knew what it all entails to survive well in a corporate sector. I had learned all the trick of the trade, but somehow the trick of the trade did not work in academia in the first instance. When I entered the academic industry, the so-called profession of the noblers, there were these elite academicians, both men and women, waiting to judge me at every front. My quiet persona was interpreted as my politics of silence. I struggled to prove my merit at every front. In fact, to the extent of even publishing at the age of 28 in the American Anthropologist. However, academia is no level playing field. Time and again, it happens that we women are being compared by our men colleagues. I want to point out here that for we women, our marriage timings, our fertility clocks, our family planning priorities, also postpartum depression, it prevents us from applying to the best of scholarships, fellowships, and other lucrative opportunities in our early career graph. I had even heard many of my senior women academicians saying that by the time our children settle, perhaps it's time that we need to take care of our aging parents. Then how do we work? When do we work? Our intersecting priorities often expose us to multiple dangers. For example, we start to compete in the rat race just like the others. We may sometimes be emotionally dependent on our colleagues for our vulnerabilities. We may petty compete and this leads us to pitfalls of frustration and depression where one tends to lose one's sense of worth. I too fell in such a vicious trap into an endless cycle of doubting one's own intrinsic worth in academia. But thankfully, one fine day, I decided to put an end to it. I initiated dialogues regarding the inherent biases which are existing in the hegemonic academic setups. I shared my concerns with my most trusted family members, friends, students, supportive colleagues at university, senior teachers and mentors in the fraternity, and the response was surprising. Perhaps they were stronger feminists than me. They taught me that we women, we should not fear judgments. We should not fear comparisons. We don't even need empathy, for empathy is an old school thought. What we need is a gender equal space, a bias free work environment, and an ambience of trust where women must not be pushed to the peripheral locales, but at the centers, working relentlessly towards our goals at our own pace. I realized this very well, that academia has its own institutional structures that empower and disempower women, making us respond to the differential power structure at a very random basis. For this reason, we women academicians need to be prepared at all times to break the bias, the politics of marginality in academia by taking risks, by speaking up in collective voices, for traveling in safe gears is always not the option. The voice of neutrality might not help all the time. And in fact, silence is also no good option for it always supports the perpetrators. It's quite another thing that when I discovered my wings and confidence, it was a bit late. I had lost my anthropologist father, who was the noblest of all the feminists I ever met in my life. He always inspired me to look around the innumerable inspirations in academia, particularly of the Indian anthropologists, young and old, who have gone that extra mile to cover life stories of women, working on problems of the tribal women, rural women, working on problems of adolescents, children, women as sex workers, migrant workers, aging women, widows, the backward caste and the Dalit women, the disabled women, the refugee women, the rural women, and the list goes on and on. 
seeking inspiration from this, I fearlessly decided to work for the cause of women empowerment in Buddhism, where I explore women re religious leadership in Buddhism. For the status of women in Buddhism is very debatable. The problems of women are subjected to patriarchal ideologies. I have often volunteered in the remote nunneries and the remote monasteries of Ladakh, where these women Buddhist monks, they are a vulnerable population trying to save their mini economy. For the patriarchal world has no empathy for them. Noted feminist scholar, uh, Bell Hooks, in her book, Feminine Mystic, she has written that the problem of women is a silent And I believe that Buddhism has taken a new shape in the 21st century, and I'm very glad that I am a part of it. I'm a part of it in the sense that I analyze the uh, narratives and the discourses as classic as the Therigatha, as well as engage with uh, multiple monks and uh, Buddhist nuns who are professors at University of Texas, University of San Diego. And along with them, I'm trying to bring up a collaboration where we anthropological ethnographers, we anthropologists, we get, uh, uh, we get access to these nunneries because these nunneries are very secretive places, they are mystical places and our entries are not that easy there. I hope and wish that I, as I see my Buddhist uh, nuns and the urban Buddhist women and the Dalit Buddhist women get empowered, I find my empowerment through their empowerment. To wrap up, I just want to mention uh, a small quote which one of my favorite feminist scholars, Gayatri Chakravarti Spevak, has mentioned in uh, one of her symposium memories. She says, the only way I can hope to suggest how the center itself is marginal is by not remaining outside in the margin and pointing my accusing finger at the center. I might do it, but by rather implicating myself in the center and seeing what politics makes it marginal. Time has arrived that we women pick up our voices and challenge the politics of marginality that surrounds us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Mitashri Srivastava, for your thought-provoking experience, your story, and your vision, of course, is noteworthy. It is not about the deconstruction of our life story. This is what you rightly mentioned. It's not all about avoiding a patriarchal society, the norms, the regulations, but you strongly hinted upon how to develop the life skills to sail through smoothly this biasness. It is all how we prove ourselves in moving ahead beyond all feminism and bring about a gender neutral society. So we wish you all good wishes for the ethnographic study you desire to do, your courage is highly admirable. Now the third speaker of this session is Dr. Sampriti Panda. A brief introduction about her. Dr. Panda is an assistant professor in the BJB Autonomous College, Bhubaneswar, Orissa. Her doctoral work focused on the transformation and livelihood among the Juam PBTGs of Orissa. Earlier to this, she served as a deputy superintendent of police in the government of Orissa. Additionally, she has been associated with the media industry and has been a TV show host and news anchor in various news channels. Her research interest is basically on tribal studies. So now I welcome Dr. Panda. The platform is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Rashmi ma'am. Namaskar and a happy Women's Day to all the beautiful, strong, and lovely women and all the respected gentlemen present here. Myself, Dr. Sampriti Panda, and today I am proud to have the honor to share this platform with the great pioneers of New Era. Yes, you are the great pioneers of New Era because of which we, the young anthropologists, today have got an opportunity to share this platform and share our opinion of this great occasion. 
the era where we can imagine a gender equal world a world free of bias stereotypes and discriminations a world that is diverse equitable and inclusive yes a world where the difference is valued and also celebrated and together we can forge women's equality collectively we can all hashtag break the bias yes on the theme break the bias is our today's web talk over the years united nation has celebrated the day on the basis of different things centered on women's rights and issues and this year the theme for international women's day 2022 is gender equality today for a sustainable tomorrow hashtag #break the bias this hashtag #break the bias calls on people to work towards a world that is equitable inclusive and free from bias and discrimination so that the playing field is level for women moving forward let me just again tell this that women's day celebrates the very essence of women all over the world and this day marks the importance of why women should be treated equally without any bias or prejudice that is why on march 8 women's day is commemorated to honor women of all ages and all groups in the world are women always allowed to live freely and up to their own terms i guess no women have always been suppressed by some or the other kind of force that has restricted their choices and freedom but as times are progressing women are rising up to their full potential and taking steps to ensure they have the means choice and freedom to speak and do whatever they want yes hashtag #break the bias do whatever we want to today on international women's day there are various ways of celebrating international women's day be it a government organization or a non government organization be it a corporate institution or a educational institution everywhere women's day is celebrated in form in different forms and in different manners some gives awards some gives speeches some gives some social gather some gives uh, address to a social gathering but ladies and gentlemen we are not here to achieve awards or to listen to any gathering or to just listen to some webinar talks we need to address some issues that we all women are still facing on a day on a daily basis and for that i would like to take up few examples the first one the first mission rather i will tell to celebrate women's day is to forge a inclusive work culture where women's career thrive and their achievements are celebrated and to mark this i will just give a example from our own institutions where we work being a working woman also being a working mother and also being a efficient employee we try to work and we try to give our best in our institutions in our work culture but are they always appreciated are they always um commented in a good way i guess no there are many a times the women of the institution try to bad mouth about other women be it of younger age or about the older age there are men who try to pull the leg of a working lady and especially if the woman is in a higher post or if she is the head of the institution definitely she has to face a lot of problems i'm sure we all working women have faced it and here in the platform we have a lot of women who can share their n number of experience until today in this 21st so called century where we are talking about let's break the bias we are still facing this bias the second thought or the second mission that i would like to share is to celebrate the work of women's creativity and elevate her visibility of her foresight as a leader yes we women are now not any more confined to the houses we are not any more any more confined to a restricted area we have the creativity and please allow us to explore and to appreciate our creativity even 
taking the example from our own UIF organization, most of the flyers, most of the things that are made are by the women. Even most of the uh, meetings organized are again conducted by women. But today I think uh, the meeting that is organized is a combined one. So we are, we are also here blessed to have men who are supporting us and there are also men who drag us. It is not the story of just a small organization. It is the story of everywhere and of every organization. Just let's think about in, in Orissa at present, we are having uh, elections, municipal elections and panchayat elections where the women are also participating and nominating themselves as leaders, as nominated leaders. But are they always given the same priority? Are they, are they the real leaders? I guess no. Just to quote one of the incidents from uh, a conversation that I had with my professor, uh, with my PhD guide, Professor R.P. Mitra sir. He said, Sampriti, in Rajasthan, women have a concept of Sarpanch Pati, where the woman is um, women is uh, depicted as a, a head sarpanch, but all the powers are with the husband of the sarpanch. It was just on a very casual conversation with sir when I realized that women, though they are having that uh, designation and power, but they do not actually enjoy it. The next mission to celebrate Women's Day is to elevate and advance is to elevate the uh, and to uh, stop the gender parity especially the women for the women who are who are the leaders be it uh, be it any kind of leader let's let's think let's just take the example of the women entrepreneurs who are in india at present the cosmetics that we all women use be it a lipstick or a kajal or anything is most of them we know a brand called as now sugar that brand is owned by a lady. Even we as mothers, we as new mothers, we are also using some products for our babies from a brand called as Mama Earth. That is also again by a woman entrepreneur who is also Indian and also having a baby. Why are we not allowing a group of, a group of entrepreneurs who, who can be just uh, the, the, the show, the, the, uh, the show of the path who can show the path of how entrepreneurship can be into a different era and women can do wonders in that. The last and not the least, I will just uh, take up one last mission for elevating or to, we can say for celebrating International Women's Day is that let's uh, inspire women to pursue goals without bias or, ba or barriers. Again, to cite this example, from a small experience of my very small tenure of teaching experience when I was posted in Nayagarh Model Degree College, which is around 100 kilometers away from Bhuvneshwar Smart City of Orissa. The girls used to come to the class the very first day. And they used to, when we used to have some interactive sessions for a month long and so gradually and slowly they used to, they used to unravel their uh, goals of life. They used to say that, yes, I want to become a, a officer. I want to become a, a working lady. I want to contribute to my family, but they are not allowed. They come here with a lot of pressure. They, they fight to come to the colleges. Most of the girls of graduation first year, they were married. The girls who were rest studying in the second year, they were married the next day. And by third year, I find all the girls of my graduation were married. If this is the way we treat the women, that too from a city or from an area which is just 100 kilometers away from a smart city, then we can think about those areas which are hundreds of kilometers away from the from the smart areas or from the urban areas. If this is the attitude that we have on women, how can we think that women tomorrow can elevate herself, can choose her career, can choose a life without any bias or barrier? And the last and the four most important uh, criteria is that we need to assist women 
who are in a position who who must be in a position of power to make informed decision about their health at present we women are the so called empowered women because we are working we are earning we are we have high, we have high educational qualifications but nobody sees what we undergo nobody tries to understand that how we manage our every day how we manage our work life balance married being married managing your in laws managing a small baby managing your work managing your career everything and with that going through a number of sleepless nights a number of tired evenings and finally ignoring your own health leading to a lot of health problems now who is going to break this bias who is going to support us yes this is this can be done only when we women stand for ourselves this can be done when we women have a partner in form of a husband a brother a son a father a friend who can help us who can support us and who can motivate us they can share the load they can share our dreams and they'll help us to move ahead at present we need to address the real issues and the real problems faced by women to hashtag break the bias on this international women's day so winding up to all the incredible women in the world let's sign on not just today but every single day a, a very happy women's day to all of you thank you all thank you so much dr sampriti panda for sharing your personal views on the plight of women in our contemporary society well you cited so many relevant examples for women at the workplace and also you shared some of your own experiences in your in your own workplace and uh, you are particularly hinting upon how to forge an inclusive work culture to celebrate a woman's creativity and to increase her visibility you are basically focusing on how to elevate a woman because in the workplace how she is oppressed she is discriminated she faces a lot of injustice inequality she is excluded being a you know a, a, an important section of the society she faces a lot of injustice and inequality so you were basic basically focusing on how to elevate uh, women so that they can um, have their right place they can enjoy their rights and their position in the society thank you very much dr panda now the fourth uh, speaker is uh, our senior scholar dr anulja l a brief introduction about dr r is a retired director of higher education government of nagaland dr r was a former teacher of the department of anthropology and principal of kohima science college autonomous pg college nagaland dr r is recipient of governor gold medal 2022 recipient of dr anjanan litra leadership award for 2019 Asiatic Society, Kolkata. Now I welcome Dr. Ayer. The floor is yours. All right. Ah, uh, yeah. Very good evening to all the esteemed, you know, participants of this uh, webinar, and I thank you so much for making me a part of this conversation. Um, first of all, a very happy uh, Women's Day to all of you, and. Uh, I'll just cut short the address and go directly to my, uh, you know, talk. Um, well, I don't have any research, you know, uh, um, findings or any presentations to be made. But what I want to do is that perhaps, you know, since there'll be, you know, younger scholars who will be talking about their own research. i should talk more about my own personal you know experiences so this will be my talk will be more of the you know uh the journey that i have taken well to begin with you know i just want to say that um today in this 21st century we find ourselves our children 
and our grandchildren. Living at a time when there is so much of progress in every aspect of human civilization, but at the same time, we are being increasingly surrounded by unsustainable economic and social practices, conflict everywhere at every level, and you know, increasing as the society becomes more complex, our life becomes more complicated. You know, prejudice and bias attitude also are you know uh, are increasing. Well, whereas uh, prejudice and bias attitudes, uh, our mindset and actions can be directed by one social group to another social group. Many a time it is women and girl child who are at the receiving end of such you know, bias attitude and actions. And I'm sure that tonight, this evening, all of us are here in this conversation because we all are deeply concerned you know, to break the bias and make our society uh, a more equitable one so that our children are more sustainable, you know, tomorrow. Having said that, you know, I also want to uh, say that, as I've said earlier, I'll be talking more about my own experiences. And I'm sure, just like me, all of you, both men and women in this conversation, have had your own experiences of, you know, of such biased mindset directed towards you at one point of time whether it has been consciously afflicted or unconsciously afflicted. And so uh, today I want to share, in fact, two narratives. And since I'm a Naga woman from Nagaland, I'll be talking about the Naga you know, experience, then about Naga society. The, the first narrative is about, it's, it's not so much of a, of a personal experience Per se, but it is more of a, you know, the existence of a systemic, systemic bias that exists in our society, in our culture. And in saying that, I just want to also uh, mention that tomorrow, the 9th of March, the government of Nagaland have called for a major, major consultation meeting with all the civil society organization in the state with all the tribal communities and with all the women organizations tomorrow to discuss about the ULB election, the urban local body, the municipal election, and why, why the government feel the need of having this consultation is because they are going to talk about the 33-person women reservation bill. Now, uh, I just want to take you back that to, to perhaps about 10 years back, 2000, in 2006, the government of Nagaland passed that Nagaland Municipal Act, which was amended. And in, and in this amendment, they have also included a 33-person reservation of women in the, in, the, in the local urban bodies. Now, after 10 years, it was passed in 2006. In 2016, for the very first time, the government of Nagaland wanted to implement this act in the elections, in the municipal elections. And what happened was total chaos and mayhem. Women were not allowed to even file their nominations. When, and Interested women candidates were being threatened and they were being discouraged by their family, their clans, their village, their, their tribal organizations. And there was, you know, so much of protest all over the state that for almost one month, you know, everything came to a standstill. And in the end, you know, you know, even the, even the chief minister, the then chief minister of the state was being told to step down from his chair. And there was so much of, you know, uh, conflict and fighting, even street fights, that 
you know, people were killed in that fight. And so in the end, what happened was that the government of Nagaland had to, you know, uh, postpone the election. Until now, till 2022, the municipal election have not been conducted in Nagaland. All, all because the government wanted to implement 33% reservation. Now, when we listen to all the arguments of why women should not contest the election, why women reservation should not be there. There were so many arguments back and, back, you know, uh, back and forth. Lots of arguments are there. And, but when we really you know, uh, try to isolate all their main arguments, it all boils down to one thing. And that is the existence of a cultural bond that forbids women to share equal responsibility alongside men, especially in the policy making and decision making level. Now, uh, to, to, to make a long story short, um, you know, we, we don't know what will happen tomorrow. What, what, what will, what will be decided? What would be the, 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 the opinion of the tribal, especially the tribal bodies, organizations? What would be the final outcome of tomorrow's consultation meeting? You know, we can't say. We, as, as a women, we just hope and pray that this time they will agree to allow women to, to you know, participate as a, as a candidate in, in, the, in the municipal election. Now, uh, all such kind of, you know, uh, systemic, you know, uh, bias that exists in the society. You know, at the end of the day, you know, although it may not touch me personally, as a woman, as a mother, and as a, as a wife or, or a homemaker, it, it may not touch me personally. But then when such kind of a systemic, you know, bias exists in the society where there is a cultural, you know, when the cultural ethos and the tradition of the, of, of the particular, you know, of the given society forbids or, you know, refuses to recognize women as equal partners, it ultimately percolates down to our home space and our workspace and as men and women, we experience we experience such kind of you know biases in different ways in different forms. Uh, this this again leads to my second narrative, which is about me, my personal experience. You know, I started my journey, my career as a as a you know teacher of anthropology, a very junior teacher in 1986. And as luck would have it, all of my senior teachers migrated, you know, senior colleagues, I mean, uh, migrated to other workplaces. And as a junior teacher, I, I became the HOD, the head of the Department of Anthropology. Now, in the college, which was the premier institution in the state with 16, you know, uh, academic departments, I was the only woman to, to head that department. And so I had to attend the staff council meetings, the board meetings. And as a young teacher, that also a woman, I was so scared because I come from a community, from a cultural background where women are not expected to, to speak out in a men's meeting. And so I hardly ever spoke in such meetings, you know. I was too scared that if I speak out something, they will put me down, put me to shame. And so I was too scared to speak. And that kind of, you know, uh, situation continued. And whenever I could not, you know, uh, bear it, and ha I had to muster my courage and speak out and voice out my concerns 
and my opinions. During such time, my gentleman colleagues used to very polite me, brush me aside, and never give importance to my opinions, my concerns. The reason is because as men, they felt that they are burdened with the responsibility to make the decision, to make the right decision based on their own observations, based on their own judgment. And so, you know, I was always brushed aside. And this continued for quite some time, for several years, until one fine day, I realized that I'm not just a woman, I'm a woman, just like they are men. I have to stop telling myself that I am just a woman, but I am a woman and my qualifications are not any less than any one of them. My expertise in my subject is not any less than their own expertise in their own subject. And so I have to speak out. And this realization really broke the bias in me. I never realized that I was also suffering from a bias because I was culturally conditioned to think in that way. And when I broke that bias that was in me, that was ingrained in me, it really gave me so much of strength and courage. And from the day, that day on, I never looked back. And after, you know, at the end, I became the principal over all my, you know, uh, my friends. And I was the first woman, you know, faculty member of that college to ever become the principal of that college. And so I feel that it was very empowering for me. It really liberated me from my own bias. And I realized that, I realized that just as I was suffering unknowingly from such kind of cultural bias, my male colleagues also are unaware that they are biased towards women because they ha also have been culturally conditioned to think that they have to make, have the responsibility. They have to, you know, uh, make the decision themselves. So, so, you know, I came to realize that and I started talking about it with them and, you know, eventually uh, to some extent, you know, things became much more, much, much more, you know, uh, friendly. And over the years, throughout my journey till my, the end of my, you know, my career, my service as director of higher education, I had to face this kind of biased attitude towards women's voices, towards women's opinions. And it has been a struggle. And, and even after retirement, it is still a struggle today. And so we really need to break this bias, as all the former speakers have said. Um, you know, uh, when, we talk, when we talk about bias, what is this? I understand that the bias is an idea. It's an idea. It's an attitude of, you know, that one category of social group holds against another category. And here we're talking about women. And it, when we look at all this, you know, when I was listening to all the former speakers, and I really must congratulate all of you to, for exploring and highlighting all the different facets of you know, bias that women you know, experiences in their life. I have to say this, that the bias, the gender bias that exists in our society is like a wall. It's like a brick wall that needs to be broken down brick by brick. And each one of us will be able to break it down one by one. Again, again, when we, when we talk about you know, the wall, the bias as a wall, we see this as an unseen or an invisible wall that divides, that separates, and that discriminates, and that, that 
closes the doors of opportunity for women. It discriminates and do not recognize the capabilities and the achievements of women in the society. And therefore, it is really very important if we really want to have a society that is gender sensitive, that is equal, we really need to break this bias, take it out from our head, from our mind. I know it's not easy. It will not happen you know, in a year or it, perhaps during my lifetime, it may not happen. But, you know, it, although it's going to be a very slow process, we have to start working continuously, whatever the challenges that we, we, we encounter, whatever the problems that comes up, we, have, we cannot afford um, to break down the wall. Um, and the worst thing about this bias is that many a time we are not aware. We are not aware that we are biased. And we just go on doing things, you know, without giving a thought to whether our words, our actions, and our attitude is biased towards another person or another category. And so it's, it's like the spoken word, you know, or the actions that follows the words is like that clue, that clue that cement and justifies the injustice, the imbalance that exists in the society. So unless and until we break down this wall, you know, we cannot imagine an, you know, an equal, gender equal you know, society or gender equity. We cannot. So why? Because, you know, there's so many, you know, even after so many decades of international frameworks and, and you know, collective campaigns, or state and non-state players giving their pledge to change their way of functioning and their structures, their organizational structures. Where even today, all these pledges, all these frameworks have not been able to remove this bias because it's so deeply ingrained and it takes time, but we have to start somewhere. And that somewhere is now. It's today, we have to start. And as academicians or members of the academia, what can we do? I mean, I think this is a question that each one of us have to start asking ourselves. Yes, you are doing great work, great research is being done, you know, identifying the problems, the issues, and the bias that exists in society. Now, the next question would be, what can I do, what can you do to remove this bias from that society. And as a member of the academia, I think we are in a, in a, in a good place, I should say, uh, because we work with young people, we work with students, and every teacher in the colleges, in the universities, is in a, in, is in, is in a very good position to be able to devise activities with the students to break down the bias that exists in their head. And each student can be an agent of change because they, they, they will go back to, to their own families with each student, at least once one family or a one neighborhood or, or you know, one area can be changed. So this is something that we, that we can also you know, think of. Or, or as researchers, we have to, you know, we have to be very, very, you know, uh, what you call uh, brave about our research data. We have to be very bold, very courageous. Many a time as a researcher, myself also, I used to think if I write this, if I publish this, what will, my, what will the people say? You know, this is one question that, that, that is always there at the back of uh, every researcher's mind. Recently, I published a book on Naga oral tradition and, you know, um, uh, and folklore. And there, I, I, I wrote a lot of things. And I 
took so much time to get it published. Why? Because I was very, very apprehensive about the, the you know, what the feedback that was, that the feedback that the community will be giving, you know, when, when the book hits the stalls. So like that, many researchers, you know, they have the hard data in their hand and they know the facts, but many a time we tend to be quite apprehensive about speaking out, you know, truthfully and presenting the data, the naked data as it is, the reality. And so as researchers, we also have to be much more courageous and let the ethnography of your research speak, let your data speak. And I think that also will, you know, go a long way in convincing, you know, people that you may not even encounter in your life by reading your papers, your, your research findings. And so um, with this, with this, uh, you know, uh, brief, you know, narration about what I went through, what is happening in Nagaland right now, you know, I just want to wish all of you a very happy, you know, Women's Day. And I want to thank all of you for your, you know, very patient hearing. And thank you so much. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much, Dr. Anugla Ayer, to ventilate your personal experience. It was quite thrilling, very inspiring for all of us. You were trying to bring about how prejudices and biases has actually increased in our society. So it is the need to make our society more equitable. You give very interesting two narratives. The first was on the systemic biases in another community, how the policy making and the decision making gets wrong during the elections. So you have to make the women equal partners at both the workplace and in the home arena as well. The second narrative you were speaking about was how a woman is uh, culturally conditioned to think that she is a woman. And you shared your own experience of what you faced when you started your career as a teacher in a college. Then gradually you, you're heading the department. Being a very young faculty, and shouldering such a heavy responsibility on your fragile shoulders, you were viewed in a different way in your society by the male counterparts. But throughout your journey, you faced many biased opinions about a woman, but very inspiring for all of us that you never gave up. You faced all the challenges positively. So in a nutshell, you wanted to uh, give us a message that uh, this brick walls need to be broken down one by one and that too continuously. Thank you so much. Our next uh, speaker is Dr. Vinita Bhatiani Kumar. A brief introduction about her. She is a retired associate professor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology St. Xavier's College, Optimus, Mumbai. Her areas of interest are gender issues, urban anthropology. She is also a life member of the Ethnographic and Folk Culture Society and the Indian Sociological Society. So now I request Dr. Vinita to share her experiences. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to speak in this uh, August forum. Uh, I have actually, I mean, I am a qualified anthropologist from Delhi University. However, after I graduated, I, have, I moved on to Mumbai and have been teaching both sociology and anthropology there. Uh, that's just about a little introduction on myself. And now post retirement, I have, thanks to Shalina and a few other friends from the uh, anthropology department, Delhi University, I have sort of re-entered into this uh, anthropology group. I've always had, a, you know, a, 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 you know, a, a, I mean, attachment with anthropology. It's a subject which has always been after my heart. And 
i have continued to uh, keep in touch with the, the subject now while teaching sociology and anthropology of course one of the uh, one of the uh, specific areas which um, i have uh, you know sort of the been ha- or had the opportunity to um, see is you know the close connection between both sociology and anthropology however even when we are talking about gender studies since we are now uh, you know talking about gender um it is kind of the this this distinction between sociology and anthropology uh, even uh, more so becomes uh, reduced anyway uh, today's theme as i see is uh breaking the gender breaking the bias or breaking the gender bias which is also the theme or the slogan for the international women's day very apt slogan i would say because over the years what we've seen uh in terms of the women's movement in india and internationally women have made tremendous efforts to break this gender bias which exists in society we've come a long way and yet we have uh, we still have a very long way to go uh, i i would however uh, like before i speak about uh, you know where we and how we have moved forward uh, talk about what i really mean by bias uh, when i'm talking about bias i'm actually uh, you know looking at bias as uh, uh, something which is uh, used to refer to preferential treatment in this case when we are because we are talking about the gender preferential treatment received by the male gender more specifically the white heterosexual male uh, another term used for this has been uh, sexism now uh, another thing which is very important is when we talk about gender is that we talk in terms of the relationships that arise because of gender because of the way society looks at uh, you know different genders differently now all the speakers before me have spoken very well in terms of their experiences uh, with reference to uh, gender bias some people somebody i mean to begin with someone uh, spoke about the uh, life cycle approach to gender to you know to di- gender differentiation Uh, leading to uh, you know violence against women in many forms then there were other people who have spoken about their you know experiences with reference to gender a uh, gender bias and also spoken in terms of what we can do to break this gender bias uh we have in indian society itself or in the women's movement and uh, in india progressed quite a lot with reference to breaking these gender biases uh to begin with uh we came up with the towards equality report in the, i think 1974 which actually brought out the stark uh the the, the stark uh, you know inequalities that existed in society in spite of the fact that we had moved ahead post independence where india granted uh, uh, indian women equality and this was also post the uh, un uh, you know declaring or the un charter which came up with the uh, with the universal declaration of human rights in which they spoke in terms of equality uh, equality with reference to to gender caste race etc and this then woke up a lot of people and a lot of women who worked towards bringing about a change for instance education which somebody spoke about earlier uh, as a means to break gender bias was uh, was uh, uh, was a very important area and it brought out the report towards equality report which was brought about showed the that uh, you know tremendous difference in educational status when it came to both men and women so education of women was encouraged we also know that in fact prior to that we had people like jyotiba uh, uh, jyotiba phule and uh, savitri bai phule who encouraged women's education uh, for which we also have a wonderful example of the women's university sndt at uh, mumbai uh, which was uh, started by thakare uh, specifically to encourage women's education because 
uh, when we talk of bias, we know that one of the significant bias that did exist was that women and men were never allowed to sit together. That uh, and and because of which they had to organize or have uh, special institutions that would uh, enroll only women for education purposes. Uh, thereafter, today, all the young anthropologists who have spoken now know or maybe cannot imagine a time where women sat separately to get educated or they were educated in, uh, in homes. They weren't even allowed to go outside the four walls of their home. We've come a long way as far as education is concerned. And now the government has come up with the right to education, which, uh, which in a way uh, would in encourage more and more women to get educated. I won't go into a, to a lot of detail on this, but I would, uh, I would also like to speak about other areas that um, where we have moved ahead. For instance, um, uh, what, I mean, uh, the one important area has been the tackling of violence against women. Uh, in this particular field, we have come up with a lot of uh, a lot of uh, new laws or improvement in existing laws uh, to help uh, women uh, break the so-called biases that have existed. For instance, we came up with the rape law post the Mathura rape case, in which uh, the burden of proof moved from the victim to from from the victim to the perpetrator this was a significant step of course it had still a long way to go some of that has happened post the uh, post the uh, rape case in in uh, in delhi uh, where it, i mean a, a lot of other improvements happened in the law uh, after that we have also had I mean, for some for some other examples, the uh, you know the PNDT Act which came up, because we know that one of the significant areas has been that of gender bias has been, and this was also mentioned earlier, was with reference to uh, female feticide. Now, technology has not been gender friendly at all, and that we see with uh, with reference to female feticide, where technology has been used to pre detect the sex of the of the child and then abort it now this resulted in the uh, women's groups rallying uh, and getting this pndt act and now we know that detecting and um, uh, announcing the sex of the child is a crime uh, other than this there have been uh, i mean uh, sexual harassment at the workplace now we've also had people here talking about uh, problems that women face at the workplace, not just with reference to coping with home and work, but also at the work biases at the workplace itself. One of these areas has been sexual harassment. And we know that uh, we also have today a law in place to address the uh, issues of sexual harassment so, so that women can perform, uh, can, uh, can perform to the fullest in the workplace. Uh, uh, now, uh, be, be, uh, besides this, we have seen uh, last last to last year was it when you had uh, the uh, the uh, uh, what was it called the uh, case in, in uh, Shaheen Bagh case in Delhi where women have actually sat on protest. Uh, this was this is a I mean an, an example of how women have been actually trying to break the barriers. Now, we, we have to, of course, um, we have a lot, lot still to go because we see a lot of other biases which haven't yet been mentioned in the previous, uh, previous um, uh, by the previous speakers. For instance, we have, uh, you know, this terrible example, I mean, terrible uh, cases of honor killing. Honor killing, we used to think was not something which happened in Indian society, but we are seeing honor killings happening in Indian society as well. This, this is a kind of regressive move that we are seeing. Then we have, uh, you know, we had the issue of Sabri Mala controversy with reference to the en entry of women into temples. This is still not being allowed. Then we have, uh, you know, uh, uh, witchcraft, which is typically looked at from the point of view of women. Women 
are actually uh, blamed for uh, uh, women are called witches and they are treated as witches basically as a way of you know uh, uh, people trying to take away their property etc uh, this is also something which is a terrible bias against women that exists in society and of course uh, to i mean uh, we also had yes the other one one important um, k uh, law which i forgot which of course uh, was very important and again this happened in delhi was uh, with reference to dowry debts and it started with the you know uh, with performing street plays that was one way of making people aware so as to bring forth or making people aware of the biases which existed and that was uh, with reference to the, Uh, street plays which were called om swaha now we i mean th- these are some examples which uh, you know immediately come to mind i have actually not had the time or because i didn't know i only came to know today that i have to speak so i have not been able to prepare this lecture and i'm just uh, off and uh, from my own memory talking about it uh, i would like now to mention a few other things with reference to the workplace and uh, you know how uh, pre existing because when we talk of bias these are biases which are inherent in society which come in the way of uh, our i mean of uh, the society being able to becoming gender just or gender uh, gender equal and these are things like i mean let's uh, take the example of say the garment industry or the construction industry where wherein biases are existing with reference to the jobs being done the the jobs being done as well as the the i mean uh, together with the jobs is the uh, uh, difference in pay now in the garment industry for instance the skilled work is given or the master is normally the male who is able to acquire skills and the women are given uh, jobs for example of uh, you know button holding and uh, fixing buttons cutting extra threads etc because this is looked at as a women's job and because it is looked at as a women's job which she does at home an extension of her biological uh, makeup she is paid less in the construction industry for instance we have um, uh, uh, women who are picking up uh, you know uh, bricks while the mason which is a skilled job is that of a male now uh, this again um, uh, i mean besides the difference that we see in the jobs allocated there is also a difference in the pay scale uh, because uh, masonry job is looked at as skilled job and picking bricks is not looked at as a skilled job so therefore the pay scales are are different and these these are the uh, you know inherent biases which come by way of uh, you know uh, equal pay now we also have another interesting uh, uh, industry which is the prawn industry in the prawn industry once again women are given the job of deveining the prawns and the packing etc is done by the males and this de- deveining etc is again paid very little because this is something which women do at home so these are some of the uh, you know uh, uh, internal biases that exist and these are what we need to actually break by highlighting on the fact that these so called norms that exist in society where we are associating women's uh, you know the w- women's work with her biology is absolutely ridiculous and needs to change uh, now challenging these so called social norms is very very important and uh, only when we challenge the existing social norms can we actually bring about uh you know uh, 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 we can sort of break the gender bias that exists in society as long as we accept social norms that exist in society we will not be able to break ge- the gender bias uh the gender bias that exists if you see our uh, you know media media is also so biased against women especially if you see our serials and see different aspects on um and you know the, the uh, on tv you see how these biases stereotypes are perpetuated and these are again they come by way of breaking the bias 
So th these are things which we need to change. We also need to change media portrayal of women. Now, the serials which are coming today are, are absolutely, you know, preposterous in the way they, uh, you know, perpetuate gender stereotypes. One of the serials which was, I mean, a lot of them are Punjabi serials now. And they are showing like, you know, how what, one of this other important, I mean, aspects is how, the, I mean, which is again, to, I mean, similar uh, uh, thing that you find where we have honor killings. And that is that, uh, uh, you know, the honor of the woman lies with the, uh, honor of the uh, family lies with the woman. And therefore, uh, th this leads to a form of violence, which is either honor killings or otherwise the daughters, they give up, they sacrifice, in quote unquote, sacrifice themselves at the altar of their family to preserve the so-called honor of the family. Now, we've seen this happening over and over again in many serials which are coming today. Uh, now, therefore, I will end here uh, with just saying that some of the campaigns, also other campaigns, which did come up more recently uh, with reference to trying to break these stereotypes. One of them was the Me Too campaign, which is, uh, you know, trying to uh, break the hegemony of the male employer in the workplace, which doesn't allow women to work um, I mean, to her fullest potential. Uh, similarly, we uh, today, uh, I mean, we have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, protests uh, going on with reference to even or campaigns going on with reference to, say, for example, providing public toilets for, uh, for women. Because if women are to be encouraged to move outside, they definitely need public toilets, which are non-existent when non-existent when it comes to women. Uh, space, I mean, uh, city, the city itself is pretty hostile towards women. And in Delhi, we have seen a lot of women's organizations even uh, striving or uh, for getting roads lighted so that women can move freely without fear. These are important things if we have to create gender equality. Uh, and when I'm talking, when I talk of gender equality, I would like to mention that gender equality is not necessarily that men and women, I mean, it, with reference to men and women are equal. There is difference between men and women and the way society treats them. So there is, uh, you know, there, there has to be basically uh, equality of means. Uh, so that women are provided with, you know, with the facilities that come by way of her attaining equality with, with men. So we have to work that little bit more towards achieving, uh, you know, e equal status with men. So, for example, when men are going out, I mean, nobody stops them. They can come back at night at one o'clock. But women have a problem because of safety. We talk about safety. The safety audit is what people are talking about these days. Also, gender budgeting is another area that people are talking about. Vibhuti Patel has been working a lot on gender uh, budgeting so that uh, in order to make uh, cities and, and, and uh, the public arena more, uh, gen more safe for women, uh, you need to have even more budgeting. The budgeting also be, needs to be done in, in, in a similar manner where budgets have to be allocated for such kind of uh, uh, facilities. Uh, with this, I will end my uh, uh, talk uh, on, uh, you know, breaking the gender bias and wishing everybody a very happy Women's Day. And thank you once again. Thank you so much, Dr. Vinita Vatia, for spelling out your views about uh, breaking the biasness in our traditional patriarchal society. Actually, how women, you spoke about how women are looked down upon. You pointed out about how the social evil practices have really spread their ugly tentacles in our society, like how women are considered as a witch, child marriage, child prostitutions, and so on and so on. Biases in the workplace, you talked about the nature of job as how 
a woman is discriminated with regards to the working hours and the wages that is paid a differential kind of treatment is done uh, to a male who is working at the same place but in a different kind of treatment is given to a woman who is working in that place you also hinted upon uh, the media portray about a woman and gender budgeting thank you so much madam for uh, precisely sharing your experience now we will listen to our last speaker professor shalini mehta a short introduction about her professor mehta taught sociology at the institute of home economics delhi university before joining me i think better skip the introduction because we are already <laughs> overstepped the time uh, so we were supposed to close it by 9 and i certainly want to hear other voices from the those who've been sitting in the sure. audience Okay. Sure. So you Please. can just forget about it. Okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to be very, very brief. I think everything that had to be said uh, has already been said. I just want to say this. For me, it's not going to be Happy Women's Day. For me, it is Happy Gender Equality, Dignity, and Perseverance Day for all. uh it's not about women alone anymore it's also about all kind of marginalities that exist within the existing hierarchies so let me be very clear uh that this platform is not going to be only about women this is going to be about gender voices yeah. gender concerns um you know i um, whatever i pen down i don't think so i'm going to waste your time reading that out at all uh but uh, let me just share one little thing with you that we create these abstract collectivist identities and then we don't really look at the hierarchies within those rankings and given that uh, i think uh, one of the purpose open that balance i wish some uh, male colleagues had volunteered to speak on the subject today and i hope uh, the future dialogues are not going to be uh, women centric alone that's uh, precisely what uh, i am saying that's not true only for uif but i think it should be largely true uh, for uh, you know, almost all social sciences i just want to explain to professor gregory here uh, that he has made me uh, chair of the gender domain so it's uh, all about you know whatever research i've done in my long career uh, whether it was uh, intercommunity relations at the outset adivasi marginalizations politics of epidemics and pandemics within the context of hiv aids environment and ecology and so on uh it's the politics of gender discourse that troubles me the most and i uh, the only thing that i want to say today uh, because i want to listen to others is this that the uh, next dialogue that we wish to have and i have here in particular northeast in mind which i think is a classic case uh, which represent uh, all these kinds of complexities angula has made my task very easy because she talked about it and uh, uh, long back before thanks to professor bera that i got trapped into this um, i had planned to do some research work on the subject in the northeast in particular uh, the violence that of 2016 that angula was referring to uh, so i don't know whether she's still there with us or not but this is an open invitation to her that please organize the next dialogue on gender and politics angula is there so i'm glad she's there i'd already messaged to her that that's what i'm expecting i've also identified some people for her whom she can approach and please angula ensure that next time we at least have two male speakers if not more than that who are coming forward to talk about it but just to refer here uh, you know what all that 
everybody's been saying young, old, all of us have gone through these cycles. It's not just one of them. You know, when they were talking, when Mitachri was talking, when Angula was talking, and Sampriti was sharing, I think as women, we've all gone through these processes. We've had our struggles. We've had our... Uh, um, but somewhere I think we ourselves also have to be blamed, as she very rightly put, Angula, that there is a bias, cultural bias. You know, we always think uh, there is that idea of victimhood, that we are the ones who are being victimized. Uh, I'm sure um, there must be some men, maybe uh, Professor Bera would like to comment about it, that it's not always the woman who feels so. I'm sure the uh, other side of the platform, men also at times feel so. Uh, but there is one thing which, as far as politics is concerned, uh, politics where women are denied that space. And this little research that I had been wanting to do with my focus on Nagaland was to challenge this belief that men are knowers of all kinds of decision-making processes. Uh, and it, 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 in other words, says that women or the agency of women in politics are not capable of handling these complex conflict situations. I think the narratives that we have heard here, uh, they are, they've come from very powerful women who have taken decisions in their life to oppose, to, to uh, rebel in their own little ways to move forward. You've also all challenged uh, the gendered stereotypes and the dichotomy of nature nurture. Yesterday, when I was speaking to, uh, to some college students um, uh, in Bhubaneswar, thanks to Itashree, you know, a young boy asked, how do we make it equal? And uh, somebody else, Daniela, whom uh, Itishri had invited, who was a scholar from, uh, from Italy, uh, she was talking about women in the kitchen. So I said, well, it's very simple. Start from there. Because you don't expect your women to come home from whatever they're doing. And as uh, very uh, well, uh, you know, with empirical data, I think, uh, who was it? Some, uh, some who showed that uh, even during the COVID times, men were not necessarily sharing the domestic responsibilities. Uh, so that's where one issue lies. The other, this whole debate, uh, the difference between male and female of human species. You know, uh, Siddharth Mukherjee, I don't know how many of you have read it. And I certainly insist, please read him. Uh, it's a 2016 publication titled The Gene. He makes a historical claim. He says, even the two most extreme human variants, male and female, she had 99.6888 percentage of genes. I repeat, he said, 99.688 percentage of genes. Now, this 0.3 percent has created this hiatus. Uh, which becomes quite unbelievable. He goes on to say the manner in which masculinity versus femininity is enacted or perceived in a society in contrast is largely determined by an environment, social memory, history, and culture, which is all nurture. So when I was asking Kumkum to share, you know, she with her historic background in history and uh, anthropology can possibly reflect that how all this occurred or how all this came about. Men, women, and third gender. We haven't talked about it at all today. We all think it's always the women who've been treated very shabbily. We have no clue uh, as to how third gender is treated. There was a beautiful poem. I uh, figured it out somewhere, but I'm not reading because it's 9.15 and I'm looking at my wall clock all the time. I'm sure everybody is getting late for their dinner. Uh, so the political violence, which, and I think that's gain where women have to come forward. You know, we've, we've been very reluctant participants in political processes. 
And, um, you know, Angula, I'm so glad to know that finally somebody has decided to talk to you people tomorrow because uh, when I sort of, uh, when I was writing this uh, research proposal, when I had just retired and I never thought I would do anything else but to sit and write what I desire to write, which hasn't happened so far, I was reading a lot of uh, literature and I found only Plato and John Stott Mills thought women were advised to refrain from masculine activities. Everybody else said women must refrain from masculine activity. And what was it masculine activity? You can't take decisions. You can't. You don't have the ability to take decisions. What you said about your professional career, what I have experienced in my professional career, uh, you know, even... <laughs> with Professor Behra sitting right in front of me, I happen to be the only woman in that uh, committee of so-called powerful people, as they tend to call it, the decision. But why? Here today, we just identified off the cuff, I didn't know many of you before this, I just identified, look at the voices, look at the clarity, look at the articulation. Now, if you don't even give them that space to articulate, uh, you just put them on a silent, this thing, you know, on a platform saying, look, uh, you know, if you do all this, then this is not something which is typical of women. The other day at Delhi University, I was talking about something called anthrofiction. And I had started with this um, powerful woman anthropologist. I wouldn't call her female <laughs> anthropologist. Um, Margaret Mead. Now, when I read about her, you know how her biographers are painting her? She was in a relationship with Ruth Benedict. She was doing this. You see, you just can't accept the fact that a woman can be a brilliant researcher, a brilliant field worker, a brilliant politician. Yesterday only I was citing to her college that if you look at the COVID-1, all those countries which handled it very well in the first phase had women prime ministers or presidents. So what happened to that immense, this thing, you know? So these barriers that I wish uh, you would take up in the next webinar, because I think I'm not going to say anything more than what I have just spoken uh, for the simple reason then I want to hear more and more voices. I think I've heard my voice for almost 40 years now. And I've spoken too often. Uh, people even complain that I talk too much. Uh, so I'm going to stop abruptly here, um, hoping that you will give us the liberty of another 20 or 30 minutes that we can hear voices from, the pe from all those who have been sitting with us for the last two and a half hours. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank it's you. It's all yours, Rashmi. Please Very nice. take questions. Yeah. Thank you so much, Professor Shalini Mehta, for your kind words in polite terms. Rashmi, my name is Shalina, please. <laughs> Shalina. <laughs> in wanted to discuss all about the marginality of gender, both men and women. And you focused on the politics of the gender discourse. You raised a very pertinent question of there should be a discussion about man, women, and also the third gender. It is really amazing listening to all the speakers. They have indeed shared their independent views of how women are subjected to discrimination and inequality in our society. So it is all about how they can be equally treated and considered in equivalent terms with regards to their rights, obligations, and opportunities. In a nutshell, it can be said that women are born carrying the burden of a cultural history of subordination and patriarchy until and unless there is a consistent and conscious struggle against this oppression and violence we cannot hope to achieve equality, justice, and human dignity for women. We need to help to break this biasness and walk out from these traditional beliefs and misconceptions in which she has been lost since centuries. So thank you so much. And now I request Professor Grigory to sum up the session. Over to Professor Grigory. 
Uh, Professor Shalina Mehta has already uh, mentioned that we should have a um, few minutes for discussion. Um, so Women should have the last word. <laughs> okay. Uh, Dr. Rashmi, please uh, uh, take, take uh, some questions uh, so that we can uh, be enlightened from the audience. Uh, sure. Yeah. Now the floor is open for discussion. I request if uh, someone would like to add something, suggest something, or raise any specific questions. Please confine it within a few minutes so that... Yeah. I, uh, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to share uh, an incident uh, which happened uh, at the University of Delhi, one of the colleges of University of Delhi. Uh, they had, uh, oh, you know, built a washroom for uh, the third gender. And uh, it remained unoccupied. In fact, it went into misuse because uh, uh, it was not used at all for almost uh, a decade. And uh, when uh, questioned, you know, uh, it was only used uh, even in an emergency. It was not used because uh, it didn't have any signage you know, on it, it, but it came between the male and the ladies, you know, men, one washroom stated men, and the other one, uh, they had a, a lady sign on it. And it was a, it's a co-ed college. And uh, the, the one washroom in the center had no label, no signage, no indication, uh, you know, but it was assumed that it was uh, neither for male or female, females, it was for the third gender. It was not used. So when questioned, you know, why it was not being used and uh, because so much money and other things had been spent on that and a lot of thought had gone when, uh, you know, people started coming out uh, and, uh, you know, of their uh, restricted, constrained, confined sexuality, so then, uh, you know, it was considered, oh, what a wonderful, what a modernistic, what a thoughtful thing to do and anything else. So the, uh, both boys and girls, because they're all between 18 and 21, you know, they were undergraduates. And they said that uh, they would be labeled if they used uh, that washroom even if it was in an emergency, even if it had dire need and, you know, both the washrooms were occupied or whatever, but they would rather go, the girls said that they would rather go to the one which read male or men and then go to the one which didn't have any label or, or, or a sign. And the, the boy said that they would uh, hate to go either to the girls' washroom and they would not be caught dead going, uh, seen visiting that empty, that vacant, that unused uh, washroom. So this is, uh, you know, as recent as uh, two years back. And uh, because uh, I couldn't, you know, discuss that after that. But uh, now most colleges uh, in, the universe, in the university have another uh, a, a, you know, another washroom, but uh, I mean, none of the washrooms now have any labels, but the women uh, know which one is theirs. And, uh, you know, uh, so this is the, so the, in spite of so much openness about sexuality, about the third gender, you can say, uh, it still hasn't been accepted by, uh, you know, the the women themselves and the, the men, you know, the, uh, them, the, the third one is still taboo, talking about it or even, you know, it's not done. And uh, so they, uh, those who are, uh, you know, open, in the, they stick together. Uh, I've seen them, uh, they, we've got, uh, you know, uh, every college has a department of uh, uh, where they discuss uh, these kind of issues. And uh, uh, so we have, you know, an association, gen you know, they talk about gender and they talk about 
other issues, so uh, sexual offenses and other things also. Uh, but this uh, was uh, something which I want to share with you because this was, uh, it, it's still happening. You know, university has reopened and uh, this uh, issue will now come up again. So this is just what I wanted to share with you and uh, thank you. Thanks for sharing, madam. If uh, anyone else would like to supplement something, I have some other suggestions. Professor yes, Bairas uh, yeah. I mean, wants to say something. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you know, uh, I really enjoyed uh, all the presentation, uh, starting from uh, Dr. Sreya Sri Bhattacharya, Dr. Mita Sri Sri Vastav, Dr. Sampriti Panda, Dr. Angul Ayar, Alar. Dr. Binita Bhatia and uh, our veteran Salina. professor Salina Mehta. All, all, all the six presentations were extremely interesting and informative. You know, actually, this is my fourth uh, <laughs> online lecture. You know, I had a physical meeting, then I attended one MOU signing ceremony, then one another webinar, and this is the fourth one. And uh, I have been there from the beginning to end. And I really enjoyed and I would like to congratulate, you know, I have nothing to comment. I would like to congratulate uh, our uh, CRD 10 group and uh, under the dynamic leadership of uh, Professor Salina Mehta and uh, Professor Itisri Padi. They are doing wonderful job. Probably this is the first group which has organized a webinar. Professor Gregory, you correct me. Uh, I'm I'm also there associated with another group, uh, CRD 11. Uh, we have made some progress, but not like uh, CRD 10. I think uh, they are our uh, flag bearer, and I'm I'm extremely happy. And uh, particularly, I'm impressed with the you know uh, presentation, talk up of the youngster, Dr. Sreesri Bhattacharya, Dr. Mita Sreesri Vastav, Dr. Sampriti Panda. We have been listening to the veteran, you know. Uh, time and again, but uh, I see amazing talent and uh, more. Uh, I think we should give them uh, the UIA platform uh, time and again so that there are many uh, talents. And uh, I'm happy that UIA is providing them the platform. And uh, uh, Dr. Rasmi Pramanik also did a good job, he moderated the whole thing session nicely. She also needs to be congratulated. And uh, I, I thanks uh, uh, Madam Srivastha for her benign presence from the beginning to end and for her remark also. Dr. Bayad and many Professor Paparo and many senior anthropologists to attended and Professor Grigori will do the ritual of uh, proposing vote of thanks but no one thanks him. That is the Pity. So before I close, I, I would like to also thank Professor Grigory because he's going to propose a lot of things. Namaskar. This is Praveen. This is Praveen. Yeah, um, I think there is no need of again congratulating and uh, like appreciating these people because they, they, they spoke from their hearts and their experiences. So uh, thank you so much for uh, those uh, uh, inputs. I think there is also bias, uh, like um, uh, one of the speakers said about uh, conditioning, uh, specifically that social conditioning, it also restrict a person like uh, a male to perform in, in like we have to see the other versions also, I think. Uh, even uh, many a time, women also don't take it. Like if, if, a, if a male is performing, uh, uh, so-called female specific words so even female will also not take I think there is need of uh, like a lot of behavioral change interventions to to all the sections of the societies so and I also thank uh, uh, Shelena Mahatma madam for mentioning my one point which I wanted to mention that we would have had at least one or two uh, like male speakers <laughs> thank you ma'am thank you so much thank you you thank should you. have volunteered for me <laughs> <Why did laughs> you <laughs> <say that? laughs>
Now I wanted to listen actually. I asked. Yes. I asked in the group, um, uh, Pravin, volunteer, uh, but you didn't. <laughs> so I, I, I don't wanted to speak. I wanted to listen. <laughs> Ah, okay, that's it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Grigori sir, please. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, words would not be enough to congratulate uh, this particular uh, research domain uh, for taking this initiative. I think this is going to be a model for other domains. And that's what I wanted. And uh, I should congratulate Professor Salina Mehta, E.T. Srin, uh, and all the uh, Professor Gregory, the... it was your persistence that brought me in. <laughs> no, anyway, I, I think I mean, in spite of, I mean, your uh, reservations, you have finally accepted to take the lead and take the challenge and take it forward. I should thank you for this uh, courageous uh, act. But I mean, even otherwise, you are made in that way. So, uh, so my, I mean, I should congratulate each and every, I mean, as uh, Professor Shalina Mehta mentioned, it was so powerful, so clear, and I mean, so articulative. Every every speaker, I I, I don't have words. I mean, starting from uh, uh, ETC, uh, Dr. Sampriti, and Dr. Sriyasi, uh, and uh, Dr. Mitasri, and the senior uh, faculty members, Dr. Vinita Bhatia, Dr. Anugla Ayer, and uh, Dr. Salina Mehta, and Rasmi Pramani, Dr. Rasmi Pramani, wonderful moderation. I mean, you have summarized everything, very, I mean, word by word. So I should congratulate, and this is an ideal uh, forum where we enjoy each and every one of them speaking from their heart. That is very important. Uh, but I, I mean, I should also want to share a few uh, views. I mean, as uh, Sali, Professor Salina Mehta was telling, what is the main perspective? In fact, uh, as you know, uh, as uh, uh, Praveen was uh, mentioning, see this stereo, I mean, this patriarchal mindset, that is uh, what is disturbing us. Patriarchal mindset, whether it is male or female, the mindset is not changing. Unless the mindset changes, I think nothing is going to happen. We know that there are laws and regulations. There are several uh, women's movements. They have come a long way, but then this mindset continues. I would simply say, for example, we still carry forward the lineal, patrilineal uh, uh, system, where we carry the husband's names in our names. Now, I was wondering, uh, like Shreya, I mean, uh, Mitasri, Mitasri Srivastava, I don't know, Mitasri Srivastava, now I see Mitasri Anand, I don't know, this change of names at one point of time, once married, when people get married, they change their names, I think that is very disturbing, why should we change the name, and I mean, first of all, we carry forward the father's name also in the early time, and afterwards we carry the husband's name, and this is part of the patriarchal mindset, and um, See in our language use, we still, I mean, I have seen many women writings, they always use male biased words. I mean, he, he, I mean, still, in spite of all this, uh, uh, our awareness, we, I still see this, I mean, why don't we use gender neutral words? I mean, I think we should be very conscious about it. And uh, uh, I, I would like to just quote, I mean, Kerala. I mean, we know that Kerala is a model, de development model, and it is a very progressive state. And it is, uh, female literacy is very high, and uh, sex ratio is in favor of females. But, and uh, ETC was mentioning about the importance of education. You know, education, I mean, there is no problem uh, of women's education in Kerala. But then, what is happening here, Kerala, about, I mean, sexual abuses? Dowry deaths, I was just uh, looking into, uh, in the last three years, 34 dowry deaths in Kerala. And highly educated, even at the, I mean, uh, doctors, and uh, at the young age, 24 years, um, the, I mean, uh, committing suicide because of uh, dowry. And the dowry, I mean, if you look at the, 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 the reality, the, this particular girl who died just a month back, 
and uh, she was um, when she was married she was given uh, i mean the, the dowry of 1 kilo gold and uh, several acres of land and a car and all these are not enough for the male side and in spite of her qualification as doctor and so on and this mindset and go i mean we always have a, a thing that the women has to get married to male and they have to go and live in the male's place i think this uh, residential you know patty patty residential uh, i think that those things have to be changed what is in what is happening in marriage two people get married and they come together they are equally i mean well talented and they have equal rights and that is what we have to carry forward and this uh, all this cannot change unless our mindset changes i think uh, uh, in fact uh, india is said to be uh, in the um, uh, according to the recent report uh, global gender gap index Uh, india has closed 62.5% of its gender gap till date and the country had ranked 112th among 153 countries in the global gender gap so you know uh, where we are uh, way behind uh, in gender gap and we need to go a long way i think uh, at least there are a few states as anugla nair was pointing out to the politics of gender Uh, in uh, kerala as well as i think in odisha also uh, women uh, reservation in polity i mean at least local gram panch i mean panchayat uh, level uh, decentralized level there is 50% reservation and therefore if you look at the uh, uh, um, panchayat uh, raj uh, system in kerala you will see more than 50% are women representing and uh, i think unless unlike uh, uh, someone else pointed out that it is ruled by men though the women are i think uh, dr anugla ayer was pointing out that or some somebody else uh, that though they are uh, i don't i don't know some priti or somebody uh, that though it is uh, women who represent the constituency it is the men who rule but it is not the case in kerala but in spite of all these developments kerala is still far behind in uh, uh, several things uh, i think we need to Uh, take stock of this, and uh, I don't want to take more time. Uh, as uh, Professor Dara already pointed out, very senior people like Professor Paparao, Professor Indu Talwa, uh, and uh, Professor Srivastava, uh, Kumkum Srivastava, and several others had participated. And I I could see that about twenty percent of males had participated in this. Uh, I mean, total participation, and there were about twenty percentage of. Uh, Male participation, uh, but then still, I'm happy that all uh, uh, continue to uh, be here. I mean, there are 25 participants now, uh, and it was a wonderful opportunity. I am looking forward to see that this particular domain uh, takes the challenges forward. And as uh, Professor uh, Salina Mehta has uh, initiated this gender uh, dialogue series. it's going to help a lot and she rightly pointed out it is not only the women who has to be made aware of these things in fact when i my, my experience goes in sericulture where the women sensitization programs always were held but then when they get back home the same thing continues the problem is it is not the women alone who have to be sensitized it is the males also who have to be sensitized so it is the gender which matters not just women Uh, I mean, in fact, today Women's International Day of Women, it should be made International uh, Gender Day. Uh, so, what we need to move is, it is not that from patriarchy to matriarchy. We need to move uh, from patriarchal society to gender justice society, and that is what our aim. And we need to be aware of it. We need to, uh, as rightly pointed out uh, by, uh, I think, uh, Dr. Anugla Ayer. we are culturally conditioned and that's where anthropology comes these constructions can be deconstructed and we need to be very conscious about it and we have taken a right step and right initiative i uh, very uh, heart i mean uh, uh, from the heart uh, bottom of my heart i thank all the people who participated in today's uh, webinar 
and i congratulate and once again wish every one of you uh, though uh, professor shalina mehta said that it is not a happy international women's day i mean we need to be still uh, unhappy about so many things but we will uh, look forward a promising gender justice world where everyone is respected and uh, everyone is recognized um, uh, unlike uh, as dr sampriti pointed out in spite of uh, good works by women uh, it is not uh, i mean it is not uh, recognized or seen it is invisible or it is made invisible by some people we need to recognize everyone whether it is male or female everyone's work needs to be recognized thank you very much once again for the organizers for the hosts and for everyone who have been uh, behind this organization of this wonderful uh, webinar thank you very much